Welcome to the second uh, workshop on cognition and control. Um, hopefully this will be an annual event for, for uh, forever. Um, and uh, I just uh, yeah, basically, uh, Muriel and I, uh, you know, put, put this together and uh, M Marcy there did most of the work. Um, She's out, the out there. Um, well, so we'll, we'll thank her at the end. But um, yeah, so thank you all for making the long trip here. I mean, some of you from thousands of, of miles away and with uh, many hours of jet lag. But uh, it's, it's a fantastic to have so many friends here and I guess some new friends as well. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's, I feel so lucky to have this incredible academic community around me. It's just nice, nice to be reminded of that. And these small workshops are the best. I guess we all know that, that com compared to these massive uh, um, you know, ISITs and CDCs, it's just really nice to have time to talk and, and uh, have a, ni a nice diverse crowd like this. So that's, that's the main point of the meeting is to get a, a diverse crowd uh, of, 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 of nice creative people and uh, have time to, to talk and, and, and drink as well. Um, <laughs> and, and hopefully pot will be legal next year and we can do it. <laughs> so, so our, our first, first speaker is a very, very good friend and, and absolute uh, amazing creative star, uh, Professor Ken Duffy from Hamilton Institute. And uh, I, I, the bio I have here just doesn't do you no, justice, I'm Yeah, I, you there's no, nothing about crocodile wrestling in there, no? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so he, but he's, he, it's not crocodiles, actually, alligator wrestling. You alligator should see wrestling. him at the at La Chua Trail That's here. It's just absolutely, <laughs> absolutely remarkable. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it, um, it, what's even more remarkable is his uh, uh, recent uh, um, his recent adventures in, in uh, applications of his work to biology and how much impact he's had in just such a short time. Unfortunately, we won't hear about that today. We're going to hear uh. about uh, quantifying computational security of multi-user systems. All right. But it, it should be just as exciting. So. Thank you very much, Sean. So I'm going to start by thanking Sean for inviting me. I mean, this is quickly becoming the highlight of every year, right? Coming to Florida in the middle of winter <laughs> uh, and enjoying the company. Um, Given I was speaking first, I thought I would start in an unusual way, which is a, well, particularly unusual way, with a picture of a curmudgeonly scientist, right? So I thought this would all wake you up. Does anybody know who this guy is? If not, you're all charlatans. This is a... Uh, Looks like uh, uh, Cary Grant. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's much grumpier than Cary Grant, actually. <laughs> this, this is Sir Peter Medawar. He won uh, the Nobel Prize for physiology or medicine in 1960, shared it with uh, one of my scientific heroes, McFarlane Burnett. But the reason he starts our story uh, has nothing to do with his work. It was because he wrote a book, um, which you can still get a copy of, called Advice to a Young Scientist, which I've managed to offend people both young and old by giving them copies of this, and if you buy it, you'll understand why. But amongst, I personally like it, and amongst the gems in this book, it contains the following quote, and the emphasis is his, it's not mine. Is that it can be said with complete confidence that any scientist of any age who wants to make important discoveries must study important problems. Duller piffling problems yield duller piffling answers. It's not enough that a problem should be interesting. Almost any problem is interesting if it's studied in sufficient depth. <laughs> any of us who are mathematically inclined know what this latter <laughs> statement <laughs> means, right? Uh, and so I think. Th like <laughs> 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 I'm, feel I'm feeling a bond here, Sean. Uh, so, on that basis, I should probably be telling you about, as Sean said, work that I'm doing with biology people, uh, which I think the, the merit in is kind of transparently obvious, where we're. Um, using modern experimental te techniques to try and determine how cells make decisions in a body. And we're using stuff like the immune system and hematopoiesis, the way blood systems are reconstructed uh, as kind of model systems to try and understand how cells make decisions. Some of it's really interesting. Anyone who's ever thought, why have you got a head at one end of your body and toes at the other, mm -hmm. given that it started out from a single set of cells, should be intrigued to try and figure out how much of that is kind of deterministically controlled. And a lot of the early stuff is very deterministic. And how much some of the later stuff, stuff like the way your immune system does surveillance, how much of that is distributed or not. And 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been troubled working on any of this stuff because the experimental techniques were not particularly quantitative and they were becoming very quantitative. Uh, not, not, not to the same extent where you can't just do in networking and dump you know, everything that you see in the system. But uh, if people are looking for a new challenge, I would recommend it. The, the space is very interesting and the experiments are becoming very cool. But I'm not going to talk about that. Um, 
and in part because in what I'm sure would cause Peter Medwar some great offence, and with apologies to, I know there are people here working in industry, I would add a caveat if I had written it, which is that it's not enough that a problem should be interesting unless you have tenure and the problem is really, really annoying you. All right? And so, apologies to those people who are not working in universities. And so on that basis, instead I'm going to tell you <laughs> <laughs> about work that Muriel, myself, and uh, one of her students, Fabio, and one of my students, Mark, have been, have been working on. And the reason I'm, it's not that I, I don't believe it's important, but um, it's really a fundamental investigation at this stage. And given it's an engineering topic after our fashion, we're not proposing solutions for anything. It's really a very fundamental investigation. And so perhaps the jury is out on whether it's important or not. But it is really annoying. <laughs> uh, and so that's, and I have tenure, so that's efficient for me. Uh, and so we're going to talk about computational security of multi-user systems. We're going to have to start by telling you what do I mean by computational security. So uh, the normal thing uh, is, Maxim picks something from a very sizable list. And if to identify what Maxim has picked, I have something where I can go, did Maxim pick number one? Did he pick option number two? Did he pick number three? Uh, and I get a yes, no answers. That's computationally secure if, if the list that Maxim picked from is very large, right? And effectively, every password system works on this basis. You have a one way hash function. Everybody may know what the hash is. If I can see the hash of your password, then what happens is I can put in words, it'll hash that word, and I can draw the comparison there. So I get yes, no, I get no further information. Right? Everybody still with me? And so if the list is very big, then it's going to take me a while to figure out, it's going to take me a lot of queries to figure out what Maxim has chosen. Um, and that's kind of a fundamental cornerstone of how all computationally secure systems work is that uh, it's going to take me a long time to figure out uh, what has been selected. Um, but you could add a little bit of probability to it. Uh, and like, so that original problem, I've, as I've described it, you would solve in about three minutes and, and we could all break for lunch. Uh, but if that's, that's kind of implicitly assuming that Maxim chooses uniformly. Right? So he, he selects uniformly at random from, from this collection. I have no prior information, so I have no way of ordering my guesses, uh, of guessing one thing over another. But what if instead Maxim picks, in, in a probabilistic fashion, he's more likely to pick one thing than another, and I know those probabilities. Okay? So why, why would it be that Maxim might not pick uniformly? I'm just going to give you two examples. Uh, one is based on uh, an old friend of mine, David Malone, has been collecting uh, cracked password files for the last uh, five or ten years. And there's a nice paper in WWW that he has last year where he gives you lists of passwords that people have picked, many of which are quite laughable. Uh, and you'll see that it's a very, um, of course, non-uniform distribution of how people pick these things. Uh, on another front, myself and Muriel, uh, Flavio and Mark have also shown that and when people do information theory style security, typically you assume you're doing uh, coding within the typical set. Things within the typical set are nearly uniformly distributed. But it turns out that the near uniform is not as good as uniform, and that it's easier to guess things in the typical set with a, um, than you might believe. Uh, and so we have a paper in ISIT last year talking about that. But I thought I would stick with David's one for a minute. David was very kind and gave me a table from a paper he's writing currently, so this is not uh, published work yet. I don't know if you know that uh, Adobe got hacked at some stage in the past year or so, and people got the source code for Photoshop, the whole shebang. But in amongst that, they also took their password file. And Adobe had done a really stupid thing. Uh, they didn't hash people's passwords. What they've actually done is they've um, just encrypted the entire password thing. So there's like one key. If you can get that one key, you get everybody's passwords. And so here's a, a, a table that uh, David gave me of, um, so th this, this, this file has not been yet been cracked, but part of the humor of this file is the secret message you give to yourself to remind yourself of the passwords. They kept that in plain text. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so this is a rank ordering. There's, there's like 150 million lines in this file and so there's there's and there's I think 60 or 70 million passwords or so um, but you can see 19 million people 
ha had this ciphertext password. And like, for example, one of the hints associated to this ciphertext password is one to six in numeral form. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're safe to conclude that that's probably one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, some of the other ones are quite entertaining too, you know. Um, the QWERTY, for example, or Adobe photo editing software, blah, 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 right? <laughs> um, but uh, there's a couple of things that are, are really noticeable, right? The, the, this is highly non-uniform is the first thing, right? Just as a very extreme case. Um, it's also very funny. Now, I did have to display a small amount of good taste, which is not really normally the way I behave, um, in that I did look for y'all in this file. <laughs> and is Eric here yet? Because uh, I'm just one. Where's Eric? Is he hiding? Where's Eric? Oh, Eric. I was wondering, <laughs> what's the name of the house you grew up in in Bordeaux? Never mind. Because uh, <laughs> if you tell me, I think I could probably figure out what your password is. Um, so uh, we're all in here. Uh, you, you're in there. Uh, I'm in there. Muriel's not. Um, but uh, I don't know if you can read this. I thought I'd have a bigger screen. This is just. Uh, this is the, the first collection of, of EDU addresses in there. Um, they're probably people you know, but some of the, some of the, the hints to self are really very entertaining. What uh, are these passwords for? They're, they're passwords for Adobe, so if you have Flash installed or anything like that, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Pardon? You need to log in to install Flash. It's kind of funny, so the, the, these are, this is... Yeah, so it's for the creative, whatever it's called, Creative Studio, or yeah, yeah something like that. Um, uh, you know, the it's kind of strange. So what happens is people have figured out what the fields are, right? So there's obviously unique IDs, and there's email addresses, and sometimes there's passwords, and sometimes there's not. So in fact, teasing Sean, there's no password for Sean. There's no ciphertext. Your email address is in there. You have a user ID. I have a password. I think it's Adobe One Two Three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think if we guess through the top ten, like I mean, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna. <laughs> Yeah, um, and so th there's a lot of entries where, where people don't have a ciphertext. Uh, in my case, there clearly is a ciphertext for a password, but there is no hint. So I don't know how they collected them. Um, but it, it, but it's, it's out there, and uh, Muriel and I were looking on the, on the plane on the way down. They're, they're really giggle-worthy, a lot of the, the hints to self. Um, but anyway, this is, this is more an element of initial humor to explain. Sometimes things are not uniform, and if a stuff in, is not uniform, how do you... Oh, look, he's changing his password. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was part of the story, really. You know, we all get an email from them saying, you should really go change this password if you use it anywhere else. And I, I really think you should. Is because an email to everybody? Yeah. Uh, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I've checked or anything, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I checked. Well, the only computer on which I have Photoshop installed is the one that Sean left me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not in it either, Max. <laughs> or at least, or at least if you are, you're not using uh, your Maxima Illinois. Eric, you're, you're in actually under your orange address. If you want to know, this has nothing to do with cryptographic security, right? This is just really bad practices. Yeah. Oh well, it's even funnier than that because the file is tripled as as far as people can figure out. Um, it's what? Um, so the way it was encrypted. Uh, is using triple DES, which is, uh, DES was the original standard in the 1970s, you use a 128-bit string. And, and here what they've done is actually, they've taken your word and they've taken the first chunk of it and encrypted it and taken a second chunk and encrypted it and the third chunk and, and like so they've padded out your word if your word isn't long enough and stuff like that. So all these, all these things that end with equals stuff is all to do with uh, just padding out the length of words and, and so I, they didn't know that this got stolen and it got discovered because it, it appeared uh, someone had obviously dumped it somewhere to be recovered later on a German website owned by someone. And now, like, <coughs> I have a copy. You can have a copy if you want. I mean, it's, we all have a copy. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if anybody's cracked it yet, but to be honest, you don't really have to because, uh, because as you can see, that so, and some of the hints are really, you know, they're really plain. And some of them are, uh, they're, they're ingenious in their lack of subtlety. They're things like, QWERTY is a very common one, and often it's oh. stuff like Y-T-R-E-W-Q, backwards, <laughs> <laughs> is, is the hint to self, you know? Anyway, um, but the, the point is that, you know, even if you guess one, two, three, four, five, six, you get about 10% of people anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and loads of them have 
uh, their hint to self is it's the same password I always use. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we're going to change this into a hackathon, maybe we could do that rather than engage in the rest of the meeting. <laughs> anyway, so, well, when, so the non-uniformity is in how the word was selected is what I'm suggesting, right? And so obviously it's highly non-uniform given, given you've got like 19 million people picking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But presumably those people who pick 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are not trying to be secure. Some of them it says same password as any, as uh, every other one, even for those. Really? Yeah. Wow, okay. And like, uh, and like some of them are, they're, they're things like in, maybe not in English, what is my second name? And stuff like that, you know, yeah. which are, you know, a bit of Google Translate is going to get you the answer, or if you've got Mural who speaks those languages besides you. Um, so is the minimum password length for like the Adobe products like six characters? Because I mean, like, um, there's such a huge amount of people that did like, you know, all the way up to six, but like six all the way up to Yeah, or one, two, three, one, two, three, I don't know. I don't really. The most well, and they don't seem to require a numeral and a letter. Like, I mean, you know, right. it, it seems like Adobe is just not. No, I mean, the, well, the, the thing is, not there. using a hash function but merely encrypting the whole thing is disastrous, right? And so that nobody would ever do that. So there's something strange has happened. They hired someone 15 years ago who put the system in place and it just grew, you know? Um, it is like if you have a mindless afternoon you wish to spend, I can give you, I can give you the file, it's quite entertaining. <laughs> uh, but only once you discover you're not in it yourself, <laughs> or, or that your hint is not something that you don't want other people to know. Um, anyway, this was meant to be an aside. Uh, <laughs> so, so if things are non-uniform, then the question becomes a bit more complicated, right? Because if Maxim has picked the password, now, with this information, for example, I would probably try one, two, three, four, five, six first, uh, and we know about f if we had picked John by the time we've got Adobe, one, two, three, we'll uh, we'll have him, right? Um, so, this was basically the subject of a very entertaining paper. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna draw your attention to the to the page numbers down here. This is this is not a typo. It's, uh, it was page two hundred four to page two hundred four. Uh, I think uh, the late James Massey obviously had a sleepless afternoon and uh, wrote this very entertaining paper, it really is small and beautiful. And the reason, th so his motivation in, in this one page paper was asking the following question, and, it, and it's peculiar I think as a probabilist, it's very peculiar that this question is not addressed in the probability literature. Um, he asked exactly that, as I'll explain, he said if, uh, if I give you a word and it's picked from a finite alphabet and I know the Shannon entropy of the word, okay, and so the distribution of how this word is selected is known by an inquisitor, and they're equipped with a, a function where they can go, is the word one, is it two, is it three? Um, does how many guesses you have to make, does that have any relationship to the Shannon entropy of the random variable? You would expect, like so, if the Shannon entropy is maximized, the thing is uniform, it's going to be the hardest thing to guess, right? Uh, so you know that on one end that kind of makes sense, and the other thing is if the Shannon entropy is very small, you know, it's quite deterministic, and so the guesses should be small. So the, is there a quantitative relationship? But the first thing we've got to address, and I'm going to come back to this when we get to the multi-user thing, is, well, how should, how should we guess W if we know it's statistics, okay? And the, uh, for, for sake of convenience, I'm going to say, let's say that the, the letters in the alphabet are ordered from most likely to least likely. The intuitive thing to do is to make guesses in order from most likely to least likely, right? Um, Maxim is more likely to have had a very strong coffee this morning than a light chamomile tea. So if I was going to guess what he drank this morning, I would probably order from most likely to least likely. Right? Um, we'll return to that later because there's something implicit about this being the optimal strategy. And, and, and it is in, in, in a reasonable sense that I will try and give you later on. And when we get to the multi-user system, we'll get into trouble because it will turn out that the, the notion of optimality is harder. But anyway, he said, okay, we're going to guess from most likely to least likely, and then the quantity that he asks about is what's the average number of guesses I have to guess before I get uh, to uh, the word that was selected with this distribution, okay? Is that reasonably clear? And the, 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 the throw up in the paper is basically Shannon entropy has nothing to do with this. Uh, basically, you can kind of get a lower bound on the average amount of guessing you have to do, but uh, in terms of Shannon entry, but there's no meaningful upper bound. And I'm going to try and briefly explain, even though I'm running far too slow, uh, I'm going to try and briefly explain why that's the case. Um, if, for example, you take a random variable, if, if the distribution I picked on this was such that it was very likely you picked number one, and then unlikely that you picked the rest, but evenly spread amongst them, 
what happens is the Shannon entropy of that random variable will be quite low because you know, most of the mass is concentrated on a single value and, and the cost of having a small amount of mass on the rest doesn't really increase the entropy. But in terms of guessing, it makes the average guesswork much, much bigger. This is called guesswork, by the way. And the reason for it is if, if, if Maxim hasn't picked this most likely thing, I'm now flummoxed. Every, every, every other option is just equally likely. And now I've basically got a uniform, a big uniform list that I have to work my way through. And so somehow you have a feeling that, uh, and I'm going to hint this, even though perhaps there's no good reason to believe it at this stage, although it turns out to be true, that the things affect how hard it is to guess stuff uh, have likelihoods that are lower than objects in the typical set, basically. So guessing gets dominated not just by stuff in the typical set, which is I, d I don't know, I, I could be highly offensive to the information theorists here. Uh, Kyle Lai Chung purportedly said there is only one theorem in information theory, the AEP, right? And um, what I'm saying is the AEP does not explain this. Okay? You have to guess beyond. Okay, so this one page paper says, well, that's not the right, that's not the right measure. Um, but Ken, I, I guess yeah? I have the opposite question. I don't understand why you would think Shannon entropy has anything to do with it. No. To begin with, I mean, to me, that's not surprising that you don't get Shannon entropy here. Okay. Now, if you took log of G, then you would get Shannon entropy. Oh, no, so, so the thing is, he, he is, and his bounds are of the sort. Oh, oh, his oh yeah, log of G, okay, good. Yeah, if you take log of G instead of G, you get Shannon Well, it's not entirely obvious, but I think you can do that using, uh, uh, yeah, it's equivalent, right? If you decrease them and then you do expectation of log of i in decreasing order that is the same as Shannon. Yeah, so you'll see that in a minute, yeah. actually, because it, it's kind of, yeah, it, it turns out to be, there is a relationship, um, but but in this there's not, and, and his bounds are of the sort. I mean, he's not, you're not interested in log g. In his case, it was like a single alphabet, a single thing. But Shannon entropy has to do with rates, so, you know, why should, uh, if you're looking at expected length, why should Shannon entropy have to do Yeah, well, I think it's because, again, you know, if you can divide and conquer, if, if, I can, if I can do the 20 questions, if I can divide and conquer, then there is an interpretation of Shannon entropy in that regard. If I can go, is it in this set or is it in that set? Uh, okay, okay, okay. So, so, and there is an interpretation there, so it's kind of like, did Maxim, Maxim is, thinks I'm picking on him, did, did Maxim pick him 1 to m, m over 2? I see. You know, and so if I can kind of bracket him by sec, then I can get to Shannon entropy via that. And, so the, and it's only a one-page paper. The, the, the illustration is merely there's a meaningful lower bound in terms of Shannon entropy, but there's no meaningful upper bound, and the reason there's no meaningful upper bound is because of the way you're weighting things. It's exactly right. So you can think about it in terms of the strength of your querying model. If your querying model allows you to ask for membership in an arbitrary subset, then you're going to get the entropy. That's even correct. Non That's if correct. If you're restricted to these point queries, then... Yeah. And so, and I mean, so the point is like, Point queries is the way computational security typically works, because um, dividing and conquers is, is, a, is, a, is a lot quicker, right? So you're trying to avoid allowing people to do that. So the next character who appears in our story, so the, the, the question is, for objects of this sort, what is the correct measure? But then can I ask you, so, yep. so if I understand you correctly, if you change the problem in the following sense, rather than having to query the entire word, you could have a system which would not be very secure, where you could first type the first letter and ask, is this the first letter? That's no, right. and then you do the second letter, et cetera, and then you would expect Shannon to That's correct. Th th this you, is and it does, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so, I mean, it's a one-page paper. The point is just merely, if you're interested in, in this, and this is a thing that represents, for example, trying to, if I pick you and I decide I'm trying to hack your password, right. and I know something about your preferences, and in fact, anyone who does a dictionary attack, that's exactly what it does in a dictionary attack, right? Anyone who's ever used the program Crack, you start with picking, come on, we've all done it. Uh, so, so, uh, I hope the feds aren't gonna, gonna see this talk. Uh, so, you're not filming this, sir. Okay, so, uh, you know, a dictionary attack basically goes through objects in the dictionary and then goes through objects in the dictionary, adding ones and two. So the standard cracking program for passwords does all that. Okay. Uh, and so it's effectively an implicit probabilistic model of that sort, okay. Okay, cool. So, so the next character who appears is another very original think thinker, Erdal Arakan, um, uh, who a couple of years later writes a slightly longer paper, uh, asking the kind of the question: Well, if if Shannon entropy is not the correct measure, what is the correct measure? But the thing is, I need more structure. If I if I just say maximum is picking from a single little list, somehow it's a very discrete problem, and and uh, it turns out. Uh, to get any smoothness in the problem, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to, or what he's chosen to do is he's picked an asymptote, which is the one that we're going to work with from here on in, who's going to have a sequence of words that are getting longer, okay? And so 
I have a word of uh, length k. And again, for each word of each, of each length, I'm going to guess the word from the most likely to the least likely. And I'm going to ask questions about how does uh, the average amount of guessing that I'm going to do, clearly, as I increase k, the number of words I'm going to have to ask is growing exponentially. So I'm going to have to kill that with a log. Right? I'm going to keep Ramon as my, my check to make sure that someone is following me. Um, so I'm going, to I'm going to look at an increasing sequence of words. And I'm, and I'm going to say, OK, for fixed k, I'm going to guess from most likely to least likely. In his case, what he's going to do, he's going to assume, for those of you who were here yesterday, he's going to assume a product measure. Um, so he's going to assume that the characters are chosen IID. And again, I can't query a character at a time. I query it a word at a time. But it, this, this IID-ness gives me a regularity in my distribution. So I feel that as k becomes large, I might be able to manage something to do with the growth rate. Now, and again, I'm going to assume, basically, I'm going to guess from the most likely to least likely. Sometimes it's the only reasonable thing to do. I'm going to have to remind you what Rini entropies are. So uh, Shannon entropy, as basically Ramon was hinting earlier on, is a way of um, quantifying, uh, ass essentially associating <coughs> how much information is an event with its likelihood. Um, and you might query, well, why is log likelihood the right thing to do? And um, one of the things that it gives you, of course, is a beautiful property to do with the amount of the average amount of information I get from seeing two independent random variables is some of the information that I get from each, which is really one of the motivating factor, factors for log. In Rini entropy, what you're doing is you're placing a different sort of weight. And that different weight loses that additivity property. Um, and so the way it works is Rini entropy is parameterized by a parameter beta. Um, beta ranges from 0 off to infinity. It's obviously undefined when beta is 1, but basically you define it to be Shannon entropy, and it smoothly goes to Shannon entropy as beta goes towards 1. So you can think of beta being 1 as going to give me Shannon entropy. Um, when beta is uh, really large, what, what happens is it says that the amount of information you're going to get from seeing this random variable is the logarithm minus the logarithm of the most likely outcome of that random variable. And as beta tends towards zero, it's kind of you're pushing the other way, what you do is you say the amount of information that I'm going to get from conducting this experiment is merely the number of distinct possible outcomes that I could see. <coughs> it's, it's like how many different values could this random variable take with positive probability. OK, so why am I reminding you of this quantity? Uh, people don't really like it, I, I suspect. That's my feeling for it. If beta is bigger than one, they kind of like it. If beta is smaller than one, uh, it loses another property, which is that if you like the notion of fixing the beta, so you're fixing your measuring of entropy, and then you're looking to see how that changes as you change the distribution, you find it loses convexity properties and so or concavity properties, and so people don't really like it. But here I'm going to ask you to think something different. We're going to have the distributions are going to be fixed. I'm thinking about changing the, the Rini parameter, right? And so what does that characterize about my distribution? And it's going to be curious. It'll turn out it really strongly characterizes um, sort of the order of the likelihood of things in this distribution. OK, so here's Arakan's proposition. It says, OK, I know that the expected guess guesswork is going to grow exponentially. So I'm going to have to kill it with a log. And I was going to exponentially in k. So I'm going to have to kill it with 1 over k log. And, and he said, OK, let's look at moments of the distribution. So I can prove the theorem, so why not? Alpha bigger than 0. And he says, the average guesswork moment at, at alpha turns out to be alpha times the Rini entropy of a single character uh, evaluated with parameter 1 upon 1 plus alpha. OK? So this is, uh, for IID character sources, this is exactly what the limit is. And in particular, if I, if I consider alpha as 1, which is kind of where we start, which is the average amount of guessing that we're going to do, then it's the Rini entropy with parameter a half, which I don't think, if anybody can tell me where that naturally arises elsewhere, I'd be quite intrigued here. Um, and I thought I'd just plot you something which... Uh, That's a good question. So yep. you have this function g. Yep. But this is clearly not always true. For example, if I take g equals 0, it satisfies your, oh no, strictly less. But still, I mean... So I don't care. I, I don't like you've sorted them in a way, but you're saying that only shows up in the constant, not in the rate of the... That's right. Converted. That's, the, that's the claim? Uh, well, so here what happens, we're guessing one person. What happens is I break ties arbitrarily. Okay. But, uh, but other than that, there is only one g. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you're right, it doesn't, yeah. 
You see? So I'm going to guess. I'm, I'm, oh, there's an abuse of notation. It's integer valued. Sorry, I didn't yeah. know that. Okay, yeah. okay. So it's not an arbitrary function. It's just no, a No, it's just an ordering. Okay, okay. And in fact, there's an abuse of notation because the g is not a fixed g. It's g depends on k. Yeah. Right, right. So for each k, okay, I. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, yeah, kind of when we wrote a paper, we tried to tidy up some of the earlier notation, and I should have added a k to the g and didn't. Um, g just sorts the words. Yeah, from most likely. Yeah, and, and breaking ties and arbitrarily. Breaking ties arbitrary. And you can see, so for example, if, um, if the thing was perfectly uniform, then, then all of these entries are the same, and blah, 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 and you put it in, and what you'll see is that yeah. it says that, uh, yeah, it, it grows at the, the rate you would expect yeah. of a uniform. Um, so given, I, I presume, most of you don't often go around idly plotting Rini entropies. I thought I might show you a picture of what it looks like. So for example, if we knew if we were interested in alpha equals one, which is kind of what Jim was asking originally, uh, what we're saying is the average amount of guessing when k becomes large is growing exponentially in k with the rate of the Rini entropy at, at about a half. Um, and so if you had a Bernoulli source everywhere, I'm probably I'm like I'm a I don't know what my background is, probability. So I, I normally pick logs and exponentials, but when I show you plots, I'll do log base too, because I got binary, binary alphabets. So this is a Bernoulli source. The red line is something you'll be familiar with. It's, it's the Shannon entropy for a given p. And what I'm plotting above it is the Rini entropy with parameter a half for that given p. And so if the thing was perfectly uniform, both the Rini and the Shannon entropy agree uh, how, on how hard it would be to guess, basically. But what you can see is basically it's harder to guess. And, and, and coming back to Ronald's earlier question and, and the points that people are making, well, given I can't divide and conquer, it's not surprising, perhaps, that it's harder to guess. But the thing is, you can actually determine what the, that exponent is, and that's this Rini entropy. Okay? So, okay. Since this early work, uh, it's been expanded in a, a number of directions. Um, there have kind of been two main characters, I would say, uh, Arkin and co-authors, and the other one is uh, Rajesh uh, Sundarsan, who was here last year, who taken this sort of thing, made modifications to the model asking, what if I don't have to guess the word exactly? What if I only have to guess it within a distortion metric? How does it relate to compression? And a bunch of other things. We're not really going to go there. That work does all exist. If people want to know about it, I'd be delighted to tell you. But I'm only going to tell you the little bits of the puzzle that I need for what I want to say later on. And so the next bits of the puzzle, the first thing you might ask is, I've, you know, Arakan has assumed that these things are IID. Uh, and so does it really matter? Right? Is that how sensitive is the results to those, to those, uh, to that assumption? And so, in a series of papers, starting again with the same uh, Dave Malone, who, who gave us those entertaining password tables, uh, showed that well, if if the original source was Markovian, everything still holds in the same way. I replace Rini entropy with the specific Rini entropy per character. Right. So the specific Rini entropy is just the average Rini entropy per character. Obviously, there's some correlation. Right. It's not just the Rini entropy of a single letter anymore. It was extended much more extremely by Charles Vester and Wayne Sullivan. And then separately, there's, and, and so that, that, that extension is like sophic shifts that satisfy a very minimal entropy condition. It basically means this thing is really a very universal sort of property. Uh, and, and again, uh, Rajesh has a really nice paper that comes at it from a different angle and shows you another class of processes also um, will satisfy these exact same inequalities. So, these growth rates are really very robust. Um, I'm going to point out one thing, again, though I suspect I won't get to the end of the talk at this rate. Um, I want to illustrate something. So Arakan, thinking about um, growth rate of these, these moments, says alpha is bigger than zero. Okay? But in this plot, or this slide, I've shown you alpha bigger than minus one. Who in their right mind frets about alpha bigger than minus one? Right? If, I'm, if I'm worrying about moments. Um, and so the only people who did this are Charles and Wayne. Now, Charles and Wayne I happen to be friendly with. They're both retired. Charles is a very famous uh, mathematical physicist for work on phase transitions. And um, Wayne Sullivan did this astounding stuff in the 70s on Markov random fields. Um, and so I asked both of them, why did you do alpha bigger than minus one? But they're old and they can't remember. <laughs> but I have a suspicion. And my suspicion is if you look at it, they're both very strong mathematicians. And the reason was because they could. The argument did not depend on alpha being bigger than zero. So of course you give it for what, for what you can legitimately say. <laughs> and so uh, now I'm going to add something very, very minor to it, which uh, uh, Mark and I did uh, a couple of years ago. And let's extend this to what happens if alpha is less than or equal to minus 1. And if alpha is less than or equal to minus 1, you can see we're going to have a trouble here with our 1 upon 1 plus alpha, where this thing has to be bigger than 0. And what happens is it turns out to be uh, minus the min entropy, right? 
And, and so why am I doing this? Okay. Well, the reason, apart from you know, <laughs> idle to keep myself off street corners, uh, the reason why I'm doing this uh, in, in some way harps back to some of the things that uh, Maxim was telling you about yesterday, if you were here, which is, here's something you all know. If I give you a moment generating function, if that moment generating function is finite in the neighborhood, the origin, you know exactly the probability measure. You know that there's a correspondence between the two. If I tell you how a sequence, uh, uh, Maxim called these uh, log moment generating functions, I would call them uh, cumulant generating functions. If, if I tell you how these things scale, what happens? So, uh, so I'm going to rewrite this. As opposed to thinking of g of wk to the alpha, I'm going to think of this as e to the alpha log g of wk. Okay. Um, and so what I've got here is a sequence of moment generating functions for uh, actually for 1 upon k log g of wk. So the logarithm of the number of guesses that you're going to ask. If I tell you how a sequence of moment generating functions scales, what you can do, if you're lucky, is relate it to how the underlying probability measures are behaving. So as opposed to talking to mo about moments, I can try and tell you something about the rare event behavior of the underlying measures. So it's not quite direct equivalence between knowing a moment generating function and knowing a distribution, but it's kind of like the, the, the asymptotic equivalent thereof. Um, and so Mark and I took all of these beautiful results that, that Arkan and these other people had done and showed that basically they had done enough work there or thereabouts. It turned out to be a little bit tricky and we used a, a method that's due to uh, Lanford from the 70s. It's, it's really nice to establish this result, but basically really what they were telling us up here, and I'm not sure that they noticed, was that they were telling us how this, the moment generating functions were scaling for 1 upon k log the number of guesses, and we could convert this into some, telling me something directly about the measure. In fact, what I'm really saying is that these things satisfy a large deviation principle. Um, I won't dig too far into this, but it, the reason that this was interesting in an advance on what they were doing was it allowed us to leverage their results to say, to get a direct estimate on the guesswork distribution. So what's the likelihood it takes me on guesses? And this estimate's really weird. I've asked combinatorics people if, they know, if they've ever seen anything of, like it, and they haven't. And it and actually works really well. So what I do is I take, uh, and you, you will remember, again, those of you who were yes, here yesterday, there's kind of a hint at the Legendre Fenchel transform. So I take this thing, which is determined in terms of these ring entropies, and then I take the Legendre Fenchel transform of it, and somehow that gives me information about the distribution. And moreover, because of this single user system, the likelihood that, that, that I guess in n guesses is actually the likelihood of the nth most likely word. Do you get it? Because we're guessing from most likely to least likely. And so the, the likelihood that it takes me n guesses is the likelihood of the nth most likely word. So it's really saying ring entropies are really somehow telling me something about the ordering of probabilities in a distribution. I don't know if that's an interpretation people have seen before. Again, I'm happy to be schooled if anybody knows. Well, there's recent work by um, Amos Lapidoff and uh, his student uh, Christoph Bunte on tasks, assigning tasks. So when you have to assign tasks, Rainy Entropy obviously makes an appearance. And uh, I, I haven't read the paper. I, I only heard uh, Amos uh, give the talk. But uh, I wonder if they have cool. cited some of these results. OK, great. OK, so I must, I must get a reference off you later. Um, you know, for the Shannon entropy, this is this is always true, right? Not just for independent, in the sense that if you have a discrete distribution, the expectation of p log one over p up to universal constants will be something like the expectation of log i times p of i if you the order probably is in decreasing order. But I don't think that's true for for any entropy, right? Um, but somehow, right, if you take the log of the number of guesses, yeah, you, 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 even if you don't have in any distribution, you should be able to get an estimate. I, I think I may be wrong about that, but I recall that you can prove this type of bound. I've not seen them, so um, possible. Okay, well, maybe we should talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So th there is. I mean, there's al also an oddity in here, either, right? So, so they 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 were talking about moments of guesswork. I'm saying they're not talking about moments of guesswork at all. They're talking about moment generating functions of actually the logarithm of the guesswork. Yeah, have, you have the moment generating function. I'm just talking about the yeah. expectation. Yeah, sure. But these, this is kind of curious, because I, I showed you this picture. Again, I, I think my timing is going to be very poor. The reason I showed you this picture was I didn't want to get into the whole hassle of telling you about limps and limpsups and telling you all the detail. But I wanted 
when I showed you a picture later on for it to make a little bit of sense. And so what happens is this lambda star x, right? So what, what is it trying to tell you? It's kind of telling you what the density, you know, I'm speaking very loosely, is what the exponential part of the density is uh, when you're at about x, right? Um, and it's the logarithm, I guess, is about, about x, right? So this runs between 0 and the logarithm of the size of the alphabet. And so if I've got a binary alphabet, the logarithm of the size of the alphabet is about 0.7. Um, so in fact, actually, you get concentration of measure um, at the point where the rate function is 0. If it's, if it's only 0 at, at one point, it's really nice. It means all the measure is concentrating onto that. And here it actually happens that that point is Shannon entropy. So for this object, the logarithm, the guesswork, uh, everything is concentrating onto Shannon entropy, but actually how the average guesswork is scaling depends on a point that's beyond uh, objects that have about Shannon entropy per character probability. So it's beyond the typical set. Stuff beyond the typical set affects the scaling. But, uh, okay, I, I better keep on going, otherwise we'll never get to where I'm trying to get to. I don't even know how much time I have. Like 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, good. All right, so we've just about got to the problem then. Uh, so the, the thing is, as I said, people have done a lot of generalizations, but one very apparent one for which there's only two prior pieces of work, I think one by Merhav and Arakan and another one by Hanwell and Sundarson, where they asked the question with, with a different interpretation. I won't give you their interpretation, I'll give you mine, which is someone has picked a string, you can either guess that string but that string has also been encrypted with a nice uniformly chosen short string, so you could guess that uniformly short string instead. So how should you do it? So they asked a question of that sort. This is like a generalization of that, where what I'm going to say is, um, what happens if you have a number of different users, and you don't need to identify all of their strings, but some subset of them? And the thing I had in mind was, was there's two obvious ones, right? It's a bit like showing you that Adobe file earlier on. Sometimes to hack into a system, uh, I don't really care how I got in, I just want to get someone's password. The other thing as well is some of the stuff that people are doing where you use coding to distribute stuff in the cloud and store little coded chunks of it here and there. And so if I crack one chunk, I can't reconstruct the information. But if I get enough chunks, so if I crack into enough servers, and it doesn't matter really which ones, I can reconstruct the data that you've hidden there. And so it's kind of a natural question, uh, I think. Uh, so again, we're going to have uh, we're going to pick, pick the same sort of asymptote. It will look quite rough. We've got v users, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to we want to identify some u less than or equal to v of their strings. Yeah? Um, and we're wondering how their scales. And, and again, the, the thing that's available to me is I have to say, is user one's password x? Is user two's password y? Right? I, I still only have this very point-like uh, questioning ability. Um, okay. And so the first thing that we have to address is, well, what's an optimal strategy, right? And um, in this paper of uh, Merhav and Arakan, for example, this is a, a fairly stock phrase that you find elsewhere, that it's clear that the best getting strategy in any reasonable sense, right? And so the thing is, well, what's a reasonable sense? And so I'm going to give you a reasonable sense. And we can argue about it if people think I'm unreasonable, which is possible. Um, so the reasonable sense I'm going to say is, is basically I'm going to codify while that original thing of guessing from most likely to least likely was in some sense optimal. I'm going to say I think this is the strongest sense in which it's optimal. Basically, a guesswork strategy in a single user case is just, it's just an ordering of the objects and telling you I'm going to ask about this one and then this one and then that one and so forth. And so that's all it is. It's just this one-to-one -one function that, that, that orders your, your list. And I'm going to say G is optimal if basically for every n the likelihood that you, your stopping time effectively, the likelihood that you get to the, to the word is more likely than, or at least as likely as any other strategy. Stochastic domination type of it, It's exactly so, as Maxim said. So what I'm saying is G of WK stochastically, is st stochastically dominated by every other S, right? And of course, it has to be some sort of stochastic property, because for example, Muriel may have guessed that Maxim started with a sweet chamomile tea this morning, and that might be very unlikely, but today it may have happened that he did. Uh, uh, and so it can't really be a path-by-path -path basis. It has to be something of the properties of the distribution. And so if... Um, if you allow me that definition, then I think it's very easy to prove, not only actually if you only have one 
user. But if you have, if I want to guess everybody, then this strategy of, uh, so let's say, now, now I want to guess uh, Ramon's, and Maxim's, and Vivek's passwords. The thing is, I can do it in any order, but I basically I keep asking from most likely to least likely for Ramon until I get his answer, and then I can move on to Maxim, or I can interchange how I do it as long as I ask each of them from most likely to least likely until I stop. And the thing is, that strategy will be stochastically dominated by every other strategy. So as long as u is equal to v, we're OK. The problem is when u is not equal to v, when I, and that's what I really care about, because I'm kind of interested in how much of a hold does it put in my security system that it's not just one person's password that I guess, but there's a few different people, and I don't care whose it is. And so the problem there is it turns out uh, that there, you're not guaranteed that there's any of this stochastic dominance anymore. Um, and I thought I would try and illustrate this very rapidly. I might skip some of the heavy math in the next bit in order to get to the end. But um, so, so the example is incredibly simple. I'm trying to guess one out of two. So, and I've got an alphabet of size three. It's a word of length one, so it's going to be nice and easy. Uh, and our alphabet is going to be coffee, strong coffee, and super strong coffee. So uh, we have Sean and Muriel, right? And um, They've only got a three-letter alphabet, and they've got a probability of 0.6 of picking the first one, and 0.2 of the, the second, and 0.2 of the third. Okay, and so the thing is, how should we construct a, a, a strategy that will stochastically dominate everything else? Well, the first thing we obviously have to do, the first user word pair, is we have to pick one of Sean and Muriel and guess the most likely word, right? Because definitely I won't have stochastic dominance by other things otherwise. And so let's say we pick Sean and um, the first item. <laughs> If it turns out that that's not correct, we now have a 50-50 chance that any of the either of the, which of the remaining words were the things that he selected. Right? But what should we do next? So we've got a 50-50 chance, should we pick either of these, of getting Sean's. But we still have a 60% chance if we pick Muriel and her most likely word now. Right? And so we're basically left with two different options. One is we go with Muriel. If that turns out to be wrong, we're now a bit stumped because now what happens is <laughs> the, the likelihood we get it in the next shot is only 50%. Do you get it? Not really. Maybe. Whereas if we stick with Sean, and even if it turns out to be wrong, the one more guess and we'll be certain. So basically it's just because it's a two-dimensional issue looking in space, so the ordering may not really be there. There can be some strategies that are better up to a certain point, but if it turns out they don't give you the answer, in hindsight you would have been better going a different route. Yeah. OK, so we're kind of flummoxed, uh, because unlike the other thing where there is only one strategy worth considering, um, now there might be several, and so I might be in trouble. But it turns out that uh, effectively, in this asymptote, there exist asymptotically optimal strategies. And the notion in which they're asymptotically optimal is effectively that rate function that I drew <coughs> earlier on. The, ex the way the exponents work are uh, as low as possible on, on the left, and then become high once they go through zero. So it's basically, again, it's like the stopping time is ensured. At least the way the stopping time is scaling is that you can't get a better exponential scaling. And, and it turns out to be very simple. The simple thing is to merely um, take the optimal individual strategies and round robin them. So I go, Sean's most likely word, Ramon's most likely word, Maxim's most likely word, Sean's second most likely word, and round robin them. And if I do that, what happens is I can produce two beautifully childish bounds, uh, one of which is basically imagine, um, imagine when I ask Sean, Ramon's, and Maxim's most likely word, I only count it once. That's obviously going to be a lower bound. You can prove it fairly readily on any strategy. If, if I, I, I allow you only account once for every, for every round that I ask. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, an upper bound on the strategy is that uh, that when I do these rounds, even when I figured out what Ramon's password is, I still include him in the loop and still ask stupid questions. Okay, um, and it turns out that th there's a big gap in those things, but in this asymptote, that that gap doesn't have any meaning and gets thrown away. So v, v is fixed this case. Right? V is going to be fixed. Yeah, that's a good question. So you'll see a picture later on. If V was growing, I'd be in deep trouble. Yeah. Um, okay, and so I won't talk long about this 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 theorem. Basically, uh, I'll, talk, I'll try, and, try and keep it quick. So basically, you can prove that if you're trying to guess u out of v, then 
then there is still this large deviation principle. I can still uh, I can still actually determine how everything behaves. Large deviations has a mantra, which is rare events happen in the most likely way, um, and 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 what happens is this theorem kind of codifies that for guessing um, that. Uh, but I won't speak about it overly long, apart from to say the following. We don't have a whiteboard, do we? Oh, yeah, we do. No. Yeah, I think it's uh, hidden behind the... Yeah, maybe I don't have time. Hey, look, I don't have time for it, sir. I won't draw it. I'll just say it. So, uh, Arakan originally told us how these moment generating functions evolve. From that, we got a large deviation principle for single users. Actually, to get this result, you have to use that large deviation principle that Mark and I proved for single users and move it to multiple users. And from that, you can get out the moment scale. And the reason for it is that the right functions that you get out of this are not convex. So there's no convex duality, this, this kind of uh, thing that's kind of necessary. And I thought I would give you a, a very simple example to try and explain why, which is actually the Mare have an Ar Arakan example. So they have uh, a source of words on a fairly sizable alphabet. That, um, that you could guess directly, or alternatively, you could guess a, a beautiful uniform string uh, that was used to encrypt that word. So you can either guess the word directly or guess the string. Uh, and, and the uniform string is on a smaller alphabet. Somehow, you've generated pure randomness. It's a bit costly, so you don't make too much of it. And it turns out that the way you discover what this string is, is that early on, you're most likely to discover it by guessing the string directly. And then beyond a, a certain point, the way you will discover the string is by actually figuring out uh, what the what the key was for its encryption, and so you get this. The the, the way cool. guessing one of the two behaves is you get this light blue line, and it's kind of fun because if you look at Merhav and Arkan's results, and remember we completely relied on on Arkan stuff in the first place, but if you use their results, which try and tackle even just only in the the one two case. Uh, they, they tackle it by trying to figure out how the moment generating functions scale. What you would actually get is you get the convex hull of this, so you get a, a straight line beneath it. Somehow you can't get the LDP because the, the right functions are all non-convex. But I'm going to say one more thing, uh, which comes back to the, the, the very clever question I got asked a second ago, which I didn't tee up, I, I should say. Uh, so this thing is, the part of the problem is if stu the stuff is not convex and stuff is a lot more subtle, it turns out if all of the user statistics were all the same, then everything is really nice and really simple and really convex. And basically what it tells you is um, if I'm trying to, if we have the three, the three guys here and they're all picking using the same statistics, then the, and I need to get two of the three of them, then what will happen is the likelihood I, I figure out um, two of the three of them before I start asking questions about objects in the typical set is, uh, that likelihood decay is basically at twice the rate of, of, of asking one individually. Right? So I just get this very simple scaling. It's like, I, it's like I've got two independent things and all that matters. It doesn't matter that I've got two of the three to pick from. It's just how many of them do I need to get. And the reason is two of them will have had to have picked unusually highly likely words for me to have managed to capture them. And on the other hand, once I got pushed through the typical set, the reason it will take me a long time to guess the passwords is that I need to guess you of them. and so. I, I kind of get u minus one of them for free, and then one of them has happened to do something very unusual. And, and, and every time I say, well, is it this unusual? I push them all out a little further and make them a little bit more unlikely. Yeah? Um, and in particular, if you ask the question, um, how does the average guesswork scale? Okay, because back to the original thing. So you're trying to guess u out of v, u and v are fixed. It turns out the only thing that matters is the difference, at least in this exponent, the only thing that matters is the difference between, um, it's kind of like you're, I need to guess two of the three, all that matters is that extra one. Two out of three, three out of four, it's the same thing, right? It's just how many additional people do you have? <laughs> and so that's my n here. And it turns out that the average guesswork scales like the Rini entropy at n plus one over n plus two. So if n is zero, which is our original case, there's no excess, I'm trying to guess one out of one then it's Rini entropy at a half. If I'm trying to guess uh, one out of two, it's Rini entropy at two thirds. If I'm trying to guess, <laughs> you see how it's going, right? So it turns out not only is a half interesting, but a half, two thirds, three quarters, four fifths, five sixths, and so on. Uh, integers are great, aren't they? But, uh, and even rationals. But, 
But the weird thing, and this comes back to the point that was early on and gives me a, a nice wrap up, is that this sequence n plus 1 over n plus 2 as n becomes large, so if v is large, now of course I can't take limits, right? But if for, as v becomes large, this is going to 1, which gives me, returns me my Shannon entropy. And so what happens is, this, uh, and, and there's lots of interesting things with this, there's a law of diminishing returns. So if I'm trying to guess 1 out of 2, or uh, I get a much bigger benefit than 1 out of 3, and so on. Um, but there, no matter how many users you have in the system, it's going to be lower bounded. The, the growth rate and how hard it is to guess is going to be lower bounded by the Shannon entry. Okay, so, so even though originally there's no role for Shannon entropy, the role for the Shannon entropy is basically, if you want a unit. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so, so it's a universal lower bound. On, on, so even if you don't know how many people are going to be using the system, then, then, then the Shannon entropy. I just thought I'd show you a plot of what these things look like. So uh, again, if I have binary IID sources, you can do this in greater generality. You've got nice examples where Markovian correlations are a problem or whatever. Um, you can see that if, if, if strings are perfectly <coughs> uniform, then basically stuff is hard to guess and no additional amount of additional people is going to make your life any easier. But uh, as things become less uniform, you start, uh, as you give me excess numbers of users, um, you can see that this is giving me my any entropy at a half, two thirds, three quarters, and so on and so forth. This is harking back to the triple DES, this is DES. So uh, if, uh, <laughs> if it turned out their key was pretty, pretty non-uniform, had a probability of a, of a quarter of picking a, a zero and three quarters of picking a one, then that number there is 10 to the 50. So if they're only trying to guess one of one, it would be 10 to the 50. If it was one of two, it would be 10 to the 48 or so. Uh, number of guesses you have to guess out of it on average to get to that 128-bit string. Okay. So uh, the summary is basically that the issue with the multi-user case was basically there's no genuinely optimal strategy. There's only asymptotically optimal strategies. And Kind of from an attacker's point of view, uh, what it's telling you is that one additional user in the system, if I can hack one of two, that's the greatest benefit to me. Giving it me additional people is less useful than one out of two. So just that one extra person makes me my life uh, a lot easier. Uh, and then the flip side of that, well, if you're, if you're designing the system and you think the statistics will all be the same, then actually Shannon entropy is the right uh, measure for, for, for how hard uh, it's going to be to guess. Yes, it does. So I'll leave it at that. Questions? So if you look at your the very beginning at your hack passwords, right? Oh yeah. It seems that I mean, so in your model you have you yeah. have an alphabet, right? You assign some distribution which may or may not be uniform, and then you take independent letters, right? Oh so no, they don't have to be independent letters. So in Arakan's original thing, there were independent yeah. letters, oh, what but, but for you? Uh, they can be suffix shifts with minimal uh, entropic conditions, Markov chains, anything you want. Yeah. Okay. So, so the process what, can. What what is the parameter that, that determines the? It's just the marginal distribution that determines the. Uh, no, it's this. It's this. So you have to have enough to have the specific Rini entropies existing. Oh, this is not the Rini entropy itself. This is the this is the yeah. specific Rini entropy. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, no, so the remarkable thing is that these results are robust, to, um, and 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 they really are in a way where uh, processes for which you wouldn't have uh, a, a random walk theorem, uh, like a, a, a kind of a kind of Cremier theorem, yeah. you still have them for this. No, but okay. Yeah. And what I was it's trying okay. to get is the following in your plot. Yeah. So if you look at these passwords, yeah. it's not so much the marginal distributions that are that you know uniform versus not uniform, but it seems like yeah. it's it's very very strongly correlated. For example, if you you know one two three one two three one two three would be much more likely than yeah. a sequence of random numbers, even if the marginals are uniform. Uh, and so I if you were to work with, I mean, if you were to make a plot that reproduces, let's say you have an alphabet of of, of three something, right? You, you might take a Markov chain, which has very high probability of going from 1 to 2, and from 2 to 3, and from 3 to 1 somehow, and, and very low probability of any other transition. So then you would get things that are almost non ergodic right? Yep. But then maybe in realistic, if you actually looked at what um, this password looks like, maybe you would actually get down to a reasonable number of guesses once you... Uh, uh, 10 to the 46 is still a large number. Right? Oh, it is, yeah. No, no. So, well, it's not actually. So the thing is, the reason, <coughs> the reason people do triple DAS rather than DAS is you can do DAS in a day. So... Uh, yeah, on a standard, yeah. 
you need to have a more miscreant style youth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you can. No, Des, you can crack. That's not a problem, and I can do it with really commodity hardware without a bother. Um, but I mean, this experience. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the, I mean, there's two different things. One is that I could have actually shown you uh, plots of what it looks like for Markov chain. So, because again, there's two ways you can you can introduce structure that makes it easier to guess. And so, I do actually have plots actually for uh, the, the Arrhenian entropies are a little annoying. Uh, you can't do the Legendre Fenchel transform thing um, explicitly, but um, you can calculate the specific Arrhenian entropy very readily for. Uh, for a Markov chain. If you do it for a binary alphabet, you get explicit expressions. And so I could show you plots, and, and you get these bowl shapes. So the more correlated the chain is, uh, the easier it is for things to guess. There's, the stuff Dave was kind of doing, um, I think, is kind of more closely related to what Jim was originally thinking. You know, again, I have words of a specific length, and I'm letting that length grow. The things that Muriel and I have been interested in is, is more like protocols that you use for dark, dark or razors and that kind of stuff that are not. Uh, hand chosen. The hand chosen stuff is more like an entertaining start. Um, but I agree completely, it's the correlation is the thing rather than uh, uh, the, the non uniformity of the distribution. And that also completely changes your exponent. Just can't think of an easy way to show you it. I'd have to show you a bowl. Uh, yeah, but yeah, you're right. But, yeah, but the results are robust to all of that stuff. I'm sorry. So, um, thank you for the talk. And pra practically speaking, what would you recommend for like Adobe or other companies who are sending these password guidelines? So what do you mean? Um, or Samsung. Or Samsung. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So I mean, I, I mean, obviously you hash everything, and um, I don't know. Like I so said, there's a lot of evidence as well that those uh, th some of, some of that stuff doesn't work. You know, making you pick more complicated passwords, um, but. That empirical stuff you really need to talk to David about rather than me. I think um, I got more, more more trapped in the limits than in uh, than in the reality. Um, this stuff, the people do do things where um, you know if, if you were hashing things properly, properly you were able to say this password has been used before without knowing what the password is. Um, and so there are systems in place for which. It, once, once a, a password is used by a sufficient number density of the population, you're not allowed to select it anymore. But I, I, uh, I think one of David's students was telling me at WWW that they had done this interesting psychological work where how annoyed were people getting <laughs> by being told your password doesn't meet our criteria and you have to, do, yeah. And, and so apparently people get very frustrated with that. And so um, they're kind of reluctant, I think, to force you to pick really good passwords. So I'd probably use Keychain or whatever. I think you might get your Mac to pick your passwords for you. Um, yeah, I don't know. But certainly don't give yourself a hint that says... I mean, some, some of them are good. What did I do with Channel 5 is a good one. But uh, my favorite type of dance or whatever. Your uni. Um, let's, let's take further this discussion yeah. during break. Uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll resume. We're on, on time at 11 because we have a short, short lunch break. Thank, thank you again, Ken. You're more than welcome.